And then they made him do box jumps. Immersive sports science. Sports science, and in this case exercise science, not bro science. Not bro science, get out the door. If you like what you see, smash that bell, smash subscribe, do all the likes and that, call of action over, let's get on with it. Now the biggest loser in the USA at least was on a massive hiatus. It was a successful show that went round during the early to mid noughties went global across different nations like Britain, Germany and Australia as well. But the original was always a highly contentious show, mainly because of the way it treated the obese participants who partook in the actual show. I'm bored with a pathetic story. It bores me. Get on the ladder. Are you ready to work? Are you ready to work? If you quit on me again, you go home and no one's gonna chase you. The Biggest Loser is a reality TV show where the participants aim to lose as much as they can during the show's time period. In the US show, at least, the, the loser, or the biggest loser, the person who loses the most, ends up winning a huge cash prize sum. Now that they've remade the show, they decided to, or aimed to have a show that was lighter without the touch of Gillian Michaels, who was highly problematic in the fact that it was incorrect teaching methods, abuse of individuals, unsafe practices that potentially harmed metabolically, physically, and mentally the participants who partook within that game There's show. There's been much research on the actual show itself. Biggest Loser competition weight was not sustainable. Permanent lifestyle intervention of 20% caloric restriction and 20% vigorous exercise can maintain the massive weight loss post-show. The vast majority of the participants managed to regain the weight with only one maintaining the lower weight they had after the show. The impact on the actual psyche of obese people is also very interesting. We don't really have a real clear understanding of how this worked. The incessant fat shaming, or shall I say the institutionalized bullying by the show, definitely had an impact from the research shown on people's views and opinions on how to exercise and whether it is actually worth it to exercise. However, all the research so far has only been done on the American participants and only a small percentage of them have actually partaken in the research. There are different formats and styles they could have chosen. For instance, the British style was a very soft approach towards training these individuals. I can see by your face you're disappointed. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. I've had enough. <laughs> Look, she's saying she's had enough, Charlotte, but what's going on? Because, this, I mean, Sarah, to me, looks like she's working like a trooper. Sarah, I think, has the type of body that is going to put on muscle quite quickly. So we all know that muscle weighs more than fat, and that could be what's happening in her instance. I don't want bloody muscle. <laughs> Go and get a hug off your fellow teammates. They could have chosen the Australian or the German versions which was like the American versions, but with the threat of not being sued by anyone. So they got rid of the actual torture element of the show. So out of those two versions, which did they choose for this new remake? The UK softy softy approach or the German Australian hardcore approach? Or shall I say the institutionalized well, bullying that I one's pretty show. boring, so let's stick with what we know. Damn boy, only in America! The show itself utilised a more Americanized version of the German or Australian versions of the same show. It is like the original, but without the shouting and the torture elements that made it popular in the first place. Thank God. This time, with a greater, or supposedly greater, heavier influence upon preparing the individual participants towards their time outside and with their social care in mind. The 
The show was described by Alan Roberts of Everyday Damn Fitness as the mental and physical torture of obese individuals. This took some criticism from the likes of Steve Cook, who really should have kept his mouth shut in that response. I know Alan Roberts is not a saint, triggered and green and all that, but never go full Steve. Not a good look. Jumps, but your social media is called, quote, every damn day fitness. Since when is working out every day, every day okay? Doesn't mean you're lifting weights every day, you fucking moron. Yoga, you can't do four days a week of training and do yoga three days a week. My point is you look for the negativity. No, Alan is actually pointing out a horrific fucking first grade personal training level observation. He's pointing out the fact that you had an obese person doing box jumps and it's fucking stupid, to which I 130. 10,000 fucking percent agree. You fabricate things and make things up, and of course you find things because it fits your agenda. No, he found you doing something really stupid on national television and called you out on it in a video and you got butt hurt. I hope you enjoy your 18,000 followers because you'll never have real impact because you bash what you hate instead of promoting what you love. Really fucking say that to you. He brought up his follower count. Well, as we all know, Alan's first account got deleted because he was speaking truth to people that got fucking sensitive, fucking snowflakes. So his account of what, 40,000 or 50,000 followers? Not to mention he has well over 200K on fucking YouTube. He doesn't need your fucking handouts, Steve. Not to mention, Alan isn't insecure to think that he has to fucking use his follower count as a sword. He actually has information and truth to back him up. Script, you're welcome in advance. If you can't take criticism, if, let me tell you something. The smartest people in the fucking world don't use social media that much. The top astrophysicist, say for maybe like Neil deGrasse Tyson, most of the, the fucking highest level brains don't have big follower counts. Are you going to go in? message each one of those and make fun of them? Like, what does that have to do with someone's impact? What does that have to do with someone being right or wrong? Bob Harper was the only original person from the original show. He was there as the presenter. Iluko, an obese to beast body transformation success story. And Jim Shark Golden Boy, Steve Cook. Oh, I'm so clever. I've got so many followers. Were the main trainers. What I can find quite surprising with the rise of body positivity, especially among those in the fat acceptance community becoming more well known into the wider environment. And with such a show that has been so in the mainstream, why has there been no comment amongst the fat acceptance community or the body positivity movement towards the actions of the individuals in the show towards that of the fat participants? In fact, there's been hardly anything at all. The only two papers I found, one from the New York Times, dated back to 2016, after the last show finished, before the current versions of shows. For a movement whose the extreme part dictate that they are being discriminated against, this is an obvious form of discrimination. Abuse of the individuals in the show is an obvious form of discrimination, potentially harming those who are obese. And most of them are probably going to be gym newbies, meaning that they don't know necessarily how to train. I think this is what I must do to train. And seeing the harsh approaches towards them, why none of them have came out and spoken against it is rather mystifying especially as it fits into their narrative of a repressed people and that of a fat phobic society that is heavily against those who are obese. The irony is, this is one of the few times that the fitness community and the obese community can stand on mutual ground on the same platform and totally agree with one another about the treatment of the individuals on the show and how it's being depicted by society. Although their ideas of how it may be depicted may be very much different to how each side would think so. A major positive amongst this version of the show was how they promoted the activities in terms of positive action, in that it was actually enjoyable for those partaking, or seemingly enjoyable, Previous shows with Gillian Michaels has shown that 
exercise was not, it was done as a chore, not as a treat. Not as we have to do this, I will enjoy it as you will have to do it or as I will fucking kill you. That kind of attitude and behaviour is not very good at prom exercise promotion. It do, people aren't going to do exercise if they don't think it's fun. Evidence by Paddy Akakakis, yes I know, what a name, dictates that people are more likely to participate in exercise if they perceive it to be fun. And these memories often derive from a very young age. Now quite a lot of people who are obese might have been obese when they were younger, at a younger age. Therefore exercise becomes harder and therefore they have to work harder to do exercise. As a result, the exercise may not be fun. Of course there are other traumatic ways in which people may not enjoy exercise. That could be down to the way the exercise was being taught or the way they felt during exercise. So the supposedly holistic approach the makers of the show said they were going to apply was not very evident. Yes, we got glimpses of it and yes, the social media indicates there was a more holistic approach. There was an overtly heavy focus upon the actual losing weight on the exercises and definitely the challenges which are the challenges themselves are the least important because it's up here that dictates whether you have the motivation and drive to want to exercise and not only want to exercise, physically feel like you're able to do so and feel like you're competent to do so. One of the main factors that prevents people from exercising is the feeling of hopelessness that exercise, especially if you're a newbie, can bring. People want quick gains and this is what this show promotes. The gains you get from this are unrealistic. It's a highly controlled, contrived environment. The exercise is controlled, the nutrition is controlled. Everything is controlled for maximum weight loss. In the outer wider environment, that does not happen necessarily. On the very last episode, they showed some of the contestants who went back home or who were eliminated. And this kind of indicated by how much they had lost. Yet again, it t might take a critical mind to observe that and realise this if they are unaware of that information. If you're not, then you look at the show and think, this is the way I must train in order to lose weight. Do I want to train like that? That seems awfully a lot scary and I will back away. And as a result, you end up losing them to want to exercise. And as a result, that cycle of getting bigger and obese continues. Respectful yet to the point no nonsense approach was utilised when discussing matters of fact and health. In terms of the style of the show and how it was put together from a production value, obviously it was very strong, there was multiple approaches to it. Yes, it started off with all that cheesy music that you expect and the cheesy audio and language that you would expect from American reality TV programme. But likewise, this is where the cliches end. The show then goes on into its kind of similar approaches to what they would have done previously, just with the added social support element that was kind of lacking throughout the rest of the show. In terms of production, if you had a disclaimer saying please do not try this at home because it's in a contrived controlled environment, yeah you should have had one of them. The training at times was perfect and applicable to this group and at other times, especially with the plyometrics, metrics, was totally inappropriate and quite frankly, totally dangerous for those individuals. For instance, they might break their ankles because their body's bones aren't used to carrying that weight and putting it through a force, which gets me to think and wonder, who actually came up with these training regimes? It is well known that the trainers themselves aren't necessarily the ones coming up with the programs. It could have been the production team. The training methods themselves were well and utterly dangerous. They were a one-on-one of what not to do when training an obese individual, especially someone who has never trained before in their life. We are talking about sedentary individuals within the first day 
and it's like trying to get them to do a one mile run, putting extra load through their joints that they are not used to. Now, it's like trying to get from couch to 5K within the first hour. Really guys, you're gonna get yourself an injury. And we saw that in show three, where one girl broke her ankles trying to do a Tough Mudder style S, or nuclear run style S, or assault course. And then they made them do box jumps. Sorry guys, I just had to whack some sense into my brain because I couldn't quite believe what I was witnessing. Now I must throw the devil's advocate there in saying that every person is an individual and you have to take on what they want to do. And it's easy to misconstrue their own ability or misinterpret their ability just because they are obese. I have seen coaches talk about, and a triathlon coach in particular, talk about having an athlete who is slightly overweight and him being heavily involved in work in terms of this guy would net was not motivated, not um, wanting to do triathlon. But in reality, this guy ended up being really good and ended up becoming GB quality athlete. And I've seen personally myself, I've tried to keep things simpler. And in reality, I should have made the exercises a lot harder. I took the fact that they were overweight and tried to keep it simple, but misinterpreted their ability. Now I've had people who were probably looked a lot healthier, but who weren't as able to do some of the exercises I set for them, which I thought they would have been able to do compared to the obese individual. So we have to take every individual regarding their exercise ability into account, but at the same time, everybody is individually different, so therefore you're probably gonna misconstrue. And this is where information about Rosenthal, Parmenian effect, and other variety effects revolving around people's perception of ability and who will do well or not. And this can become clearly evident in, their, in the way the coaches, Rodina Luco, especially having a broad look at her participants, instead of foc ended up focusing on one, rather than focusing on the individual who needed the most attention, but at the same time trying to spread that attention across each participant. Now, if an obese individual wants to do a HIT class, let them do a HIT class, but tell them to be mindful of the impact it can have in their joints. Be mindful of the way that being overweight means that you're more likely going to be working at a higher work rate than someone who is not obese. And as a result, the exercise is harder for them. They might overheat quicker, for instance. But the individual has to decide whether they are capable to do it. And sometimes it's up here. But the most of the time, and you as a PT, you can't necessarily interpret what's up here. You have to interpret what's in front of you and how you can best benefit your client without necessarily injuring them. As a fitness instructor, I've had obese individuals turn up for my Les Mills Grit HIT classes. This is where adaptation of exercises, modifiers as a beach body like to call them, are vital. You want to do the exercise, you want to be like everyone else, they want to be the hip or trendy person who does these high intensity classes. Well, let, if you're unable to do a burpee jump, which might not be safe for you as well, Let's break it down. Let's do squat down, hands touch the ground, legs out, legs in, come up. That might be an easier or a better way to do it. That is also a lot safer. There was also a nutrition element, but I wish they just deep dived into it. Fitness is 50% of what you do exercise wise and 50% what, what you eat. That is fitness. Then your psychology around that fitness comes into play to help it maintain in order to keep your drive going. That this is important, but these are just as important. And by not going into full depth on the nutrition, which many of the viewers probably would have enjoyed, especially if you're obese, to be able to understand how to eat healthy, especially as over 60% of Americans are now obese, meaning that this is going to support many of them and many of them might want to know because it's personal towards them. It was strangely lacking. 
there was just a heavy focus on challenges. And the exercise over the challenges was almost meh, we're thrown in there, but it's just not as important. Yes, challenges can be fun, but there was such a heavy focus and from the production point of view on challenges. Why is that? It, if you have a challenge show, maybe because it's more interesting to a wider audience who may not be interested in exercise. Possibly. I don't know. The whole program is a challenge, so therefore, that might give you an indication why they thought like this. It's just a more interesting way, and their bias is bent towards that. For me, as a, from a scientific point of view, I like to hear the whole holistic elements around it, the nutrition, the psychology, the sociology, but that's where my biases lay. What I also like is scientific information, and that's also where my biases lie, really. Science helps to explain, if it's nuanced and in context, why things happen, how they happen, and how they can improve that individual. And this might be useful if done simply towards the viewer and help the viewers understand too. The irony is, the biggest draw to the show is also its biggest weakness. And that is the show design itself, being a game show reality show. The art of it is to lose as much weight as possible in order to have a winner. That's all fine and that, but it neglects the overall health of the individual over their weight being lost as much as possible. Yes, them being at, let's say, 300 pounds is not healthy, I know that. It doesn't give them the tools they need to improve upon it, and that's where the show's problem is. It's a draw. Look at these people lose as much weight as possible. That is awesome, that is epic, and this is not taken away from the participants. Their abilities and what they're doing on the show is utterly epic, and I'm in absolute admiration of them. But at the same time, what skills are you giving them outside of the game show itself? And that is the problem with the game show in the past, in that it didn't support the individuals, it sent them home towards their enablers, towards the same environment, didn't let them have control or understanding of their own nutrition, so they went back to eating the same way. Education is just as important in terms of helping someone who is obese, educating them on how to train properly when you're outside, educating them that they will not lose the same amount of weight as they would do, educating them with the basic facts of science, the basic fitness, exercise science that they will need, that everyone needs when they enter the gym. And I'm not talking about reading up journals, I'm just talking about the basics here. You hit peaks, the basics of knowing how to grow muscle, the basics of knowing of trying to get into a caloric balance. This was not taught to them previously, and hence why many of them then reverted back. And that is the damaging part this show had upon them mentally, socially, and physically. Now in terms of psychologically, and ignore everything in this model here, we're just going to focus purely on the health belief model and the trans theoretical model, as they best reflect what would happen here. Although, as you can see, it's a multi-dimensional approach. The health belief model stipulates the likelihood of an individual's engaging in preventative health behaviours. This depends on the person's perception of the severity of the potential illness, as well as his or her appraisal of the costs and benefits of taking action. An individual who feels that the potential illness is serious, that he or she is at risk, and that the pros of taking action outweigh the cons is likely to adopt the target behaviour. Now this is necessarily not the case. Some people might like the lifestyle and there's other interfering factors. Now the stages change element of the trans theoretical model dictates that you go through a series of contemplation, uh, preparation, action, maintenance and then pre-contemplation before actually partaking in the action to change and improve upon your health. It's like liken it to tackling obesity within schools. We can focus on the, the behavioural change within the school environment. But where do the kids spend most of the time? At home. And if the home is not a great environment for positive health, or the education is poor there, who is feeding the kids? When the kids grow up, what behaviours are they likely to go on? They're likely to follow the habits they learnt as a child. 
in the home. The parents are highly influential. The loved ones around them are highly influential. The friends are highly influential, but if the environment around the friends is also influential. Social demographic reasons. As Dr. Joshua Woolridge says, you don't, there are places that are food deserts, in which case there are poor quality food. And the reason why supermarkets don't necessarily put a lot of healthy food there is because it might not sell as well. It, we're talking about capitalism here. People have got to make money. If the business don't make money, people don't have a living. It's in some cases a stupid decision to stick a supermarket in an environment that is highly poor, like we see in certain areas of the UK. And this is very similar in the US as well. In areas where there are council states, you often don't find big supermarkets nearby. They're often further away. And the reason being is because it makes a stupid commercial decision to stick one there. Often in these poor areas, you don't find vast fruit and veg aisles. The fresh or healthy foods are generally tend to be less. And this goes back to the education and capitalism. And also, what is perceptionally seen as cheaper? Fruit and veg is actually very cheap, but doesn't store well. So people generally tend to go towards stuff that will store well, so meaning they'd have to shop less. Or they might perceive things like a ready meal to be cheap, when in reality, ready meals have actually become more expensive. Now, I'm not sure about the US, the ready meals might be a little bit cheaper there, but that's my experience of shopping within Europe. We know that in the US, for instance, there are a lot of people who don't know how to cook, who weren't taught how to cook at school, whose parents didn't teach the kids how to cook. Maybe the parents didn't know, so they brought the kids up, already pre-packaged meals. And that's what they lived on, that's what they know, and that's what they continue. Problem is, this high packaged food is often high calories, quite often high carbs, which is not necessarily a bad thing if you're highly sporty and athletic, but if you're sedentary, you don't need it. High in saturated fats, all the things that are, should be eating in moderation, not all the time. And moderation differs depending on food, and that's one thing that doesn't get taught that well, I don't think. Also in American diets, high calories, massive plated meals apparently. Big plated meals. Pancakes are breakfast. Someone please tell me the pancakes are breakfast thing. I don't get it. Why would you eat a pancake for breakfast? That is a dessert. That's a treat. The knowledge is there, it's just that the film company doesn't want to express it for whatever reason. Right. Is it because they don't want to get sued? I don't know. Um, is it just because it's just not that interesting than the challenges? The social media content, on the other hand, good, okay. Training methods, good, well, ex okay, expressed, well expressed, but contextually they have to be towards the individual themselves and Cook and the other person explains it really well. I don't have a problem with it really. The social content that should have gone in the TV program was on snippets online. Okay, but maybe some of that could have been better done on television because not everyone looks at the social media, not everyone looks at the website and makes a decision from that. Quite a lot of television is actually watched, okay, maybe not at the moment while we're in pandemic mode, lockdown, quarantine, here we go, that's my monetization gone, if I was actually monetized. In these dark times, maybe not so much, but generally most television is actually watched live. And as a result, a lot of people who may not want to express, maybe because of algorithms, they, they, it doesn't necessarily enter their filter bubble, or they might not just want to search on it online, may not find this stuff. The Biggest Loser USA 2020 is a vast improvement from the past in terms of the social holistic elements to it. However, the show does not do do a good job in detailing this and what they actually do in any extent on their actual programming. The social media side of it and the online website is brilliant. However, they still don't go into enough for my liking. They don't go behind the science behind my liking. And many people watching the show will not be able to guess how to train, which is very problematic. Production-wise, very good. Film mechanics wise is quite weird. I believe the training methods utilize negligent. All in all, I give The Biggest Loser a score of 
76.05 and I have to admit it surprised me it was that high. But one cannot ignore the negligence shown on the show.